All right, welcome everyone to this webinar on systematic testing and computer vision systems. My name is Skip Everling. I'm the head of developer relations here at Kalena, the AI quality company. Very excited to talk about this topic with you today. It's a lot of interesting stuff here, um, a lot of very critical stuff related to computer vision testing. And I'm eager to get into it with you. Thank you all for joining. Uh, let me go ahead and show you the outline that we have for the talk today. First thing I'll cover, of course, the importance of systematic testing for computer vision systems. If you're working in computer vision right now, especially in an area like autonomous vehicles, you know how important it is to get your computer vision systems working correctly. I'll talk about three levels of systematic testing. So these are the three levels to ensure that you've got a robust testing framework that at the scenario level, you're catching regressions and you're testing at the product level, not just the model level. And then I'll talk about the three pillars of quality as far as getting your models and your data uh, quality uh, up to your quality standards. And then talking about end-to-end -end quality related to product level testing. After that, if we, have, if we have some time, I'll show how you can uh, use a system like Kalena to implement these practices. Feel free to ask questions using the Q&A feature uh, in the Zoom here. We'll uh, try and answer those live. I've got the, the team here with me. I'll try and answer those live. Uh, and then if we've got some time at the end of the talk, I'll also uh, try and read at least a few of those out loud. So please feel free to ask questions throughout. So to start, there are a lot of really good reasons for having a robust computer vision framework. Obviously, safety and reliability are huge, especially in the area of autonomous vehicles, anything where you're interacting with humans or anything where there's sensitive uh, data. Um, having a robust computer vision system is critical for trust and reputation for your product and for your business. Uh, increasingly, there's strict compliance requirements, and those are only going to increase and get more nuanced. And so having a robust testing framework is essential to make sure that you are actually in compliance and that you can demonstrate that compliance. And then, of course, increasing the capabilities of your computer vision models so that the models that you're putting into the world are better at all of the scenarios that they encounter. And again, just to reiterate, it's absolutely critical to get testing right in sensitive domains like autonomous vehicles, um, robots interacting with humans, things like that. Um, I also wanted to make a note here about special challenges for autonomous vehicle testing because uh, it's it's kind of a hot topic at the moment. The first one that I want to highlight, and this is true for, for any model really, but especially in autonomous vehicle testing, you have this long tail distribution of scenarios. So autonomous vehicles encounter this vast and ever-changing array of scenarios. You don't know, the vehicle doesn't know what it's going to encounter, especially an open world um, vehicle like a, a Waymo or a self-driving car. Um, a little bit different when you have a controlled environment like a warehouse, but especially when you're in an open-ended environment, there's a long tail distribution of scenarios. Testing every possible combination of things like lighting, weather, road conditions, object interactions, it's impossible to, to fully cover it because there's an infinite set of possibilities. And so this long tail distribution makes achieving comprehensive coverage difficult. We'll talk about how you can actually address this long tail and work systematically towards building out test cases that actually do capture a lot of that long tail. But this is one of the common difficulties for autonomous vehicle testing. The next one, edge cases related to that long tail distribution. And adversarial examples, which um, are I'm <laughs> expecting will probably increase, unfortunately, as people get a little <laughs> uncomfortable with some of the uh, automated robotics in our world. So automated vehicles and robots have to be robust against these critical events, like you know, if you're a self-driving car, a sudden animal appearance, or unexpected object deformations. And then you, know, you might have a malicious actor create an adversarial input something specifically designed to fool your system. And so being able to handle that when that happens means you have to start deliberately curating test cases so that you can 
model how your model is going to perform in these unusual scenarios. Last thing I'll mention, there's a lot of special challenges here, but the last one I want to mention is autonomous vehicles and robotics and things that are in the real world, they rely on multiple sensors, just like we as humans rely on multiple sensors, our eyes, our ears, our nose. For a car, especially with computer vision, it's lots of different types of vision, different cameras in different places. You have LIDAR, so different uh, types of data coming in, radar. All this has to work in concert so that the information in the pipeline is feeding towards intelligent decision-making for that autonomous entity. So your testing has to ensure seamless information fusion so that you're doing that properly. So I wanna jump into, okay, so now, now that we understand the challenges here and why it's important to get it right, what are the best practices for testing AI products? What do I need to do? This is where I'm gonna get into the three levels. And this is true for computer vision, but it's also true for really any ML use case. This testing framework applies no matter what your objective is. We're gonna be using computer vision examples here in this talk, but everything that I'm gonna tell you for this section is gonna be relevant to any kind of model you're training. So the first one is scenario level testing. Sometimes we call this unit level testing. What this means is you're testing models at the scenario level, not at the aggregate class level. You're taking your full test data. If you're taking your full test data and you're just running a benchmark on the full test data, that's an aggregate metric. But you don't know how the test data is performing within the scenarios represented within that test data. Uh, and you really need to understand that if you want to have robust performance, because the aggregate class, the aggregate level, won't show you that information. And the goal is to get a balanced distribution of testing data across scenarios so that you can have your model be performing in a balanced way across all of those scenarios. After scenario level testing, you want to be thinking about regression testing. Regression testing meaning catching regressions, catching uh, failures in your model over time, keeping track of these things, and then creating tests to continually monitor for those types of regressions. This is going to help you taste that long tail that I mentioned, verify that your models are not silently regressing, which will inevitably will happen. And in the course of that, as you're seeing all the different failure modes that your models encounter, you're building up an institutional knowledge base of testing scenarios and these edge cases, like I mentioned before. And this way, over time, you're not continually surprised by something that's popping up again and again. You're proactively catching it ahead of time and crystallizing that in a knowledge base. And the last thing is product level testing. By product level testing, I mean not just testing the component models, not just testing models individually, but testing your system end to end, whatever your system is. So if it's a self-driving car and the system is to decide whether to cross an intersection, there are a lot of different models involved using a lot of different data. And you want to test the end-to-end -end result. That's what really matters at the end of the day. This, how well is your product performing in the actual scenario? And you need to use product-level metrics to do that, not just traditional ML metrics. Something like a, a recall score might be important for a component model, but it's not necessarily going to be informative at the product level. And I'll show examples of that later on this talk. So the first thing is scenario-level testing. We're going to take a look at this case study just to illustrate here, evaluating computer vision systems for person detection. Um, you could also call it pedestrian detection if you're an autonomous vehicle. This data set um, that I'm talking about at the moment is called COCO. It's a large, large scale uh, object detection, segmentation, and captioning data set. It's open source, academic paper. The objective that we're going to be looking at here is identify people in images and label them with bounding boxes. So you can see in these images, there are bounding boxes around the people. And that's the target for the models that we're going to be training. These, in this case, we're looking at ground truth, but this would be what the model is trying to do. And as far as scenario level testing, the types of scenarios that are encountered in this data set are parts of the body are occluded. So you can see down here in this bottom image, there are a lot of different people and not all of them is visible. There's a lot of occlusion here, people being blocked by other people. And similarly, another scenario is you know the size of the person relative to the image. So in this image, it's 
a large representation of the person compared to over here is a smaller representation. And then over here, for example, the, these are people, we're just seeing the back of, of their heads. So as far as the scenario, it's, you know, back of a head and, and that's that's all that's being shown as far as the body. And so these each one of those things is a different kind of scenario within the larger data set. And so you want to be catching those things. You want to be able to test against those things using a unit test. A unit test is the same thing as a scenario level test. Basically, it's a group of data points that share similar characteristics, such as you know, back of a person's head. To illustrate just with a concrete example, let's say you're comparing two models to perform on this particular data set, this person detection problem, this mask RCNN model, and this YOLO v4 model. You've got this aggregate metric of recall across your entire test data set. The YOLO v4 is, is doing better on this recall score. So naively, we might want to deploy that, but we don't know how it's performing on those scenarios. And in order to do that, we need to look deeper. So what we're looking at now is if you look just at this green highlighted row, that's the total data set. And we can see our metrics for that total aggregate data set. Right here, we're seeing the recall score of 81. That's what's being represented here. Over here, we're seeing a recall score of 85. That's the 85% here. But everything below that is a different unit test. So in this case, we're looking at how much of the body is being shown, the whole body, upper body, lower body, just the head, the arm, or a leg. Down here is another set of test cases relating to how big the representation of the person is in the image. And when we're looking at unit tests, we can immediately see that if you look at these red highlighted rows now, while this yellow V4 is doing a good bit better on recall overall, and in most test cases, most of these scenarios, there are a few such as this when only an arm is showing, or when the representation of the person is very big in the image, where it's worse than our previous model here, this mask RCNN model. And these things are immediately obvious because we've broken down our data into a scenario level test. We can catch these right away so that if we do want to deploy this overall better model, this aggregate improvement, we will want to at least ensure that this is uh, acceptable for our performance, or we can focus on getting new training data to improve the performance here. In any case, we, we know where to focus and, and we know it needs to be changed in order to move forward because we've broken things down into unit tests and we're seeing our metrics based on those unit tests. This gets at something that's called the hidden stratification problem. This is defined academically in this paper here, if you really want to get into it. Uh, the paper used this example of chest trains uh, of these medical images. The main idea here for this hidden stratification is that aggregate metrics can look good, but they hide disparities. They're hidden strata, hidden stratifications. Uh, and that's a problem because of what we were just looking at before, where performance is variable and that may not be obvious. Models exhibit highly variable performance across different subclasses. In this image that we're looking at, you can see that there are three different AUC curves. And the uh, important green line is performing worse than the aggregate. And so that's something that we would want to be able to focus on. But if it's hidden, then we can't know to do that until we encounter some failure mode in real life. And that could be disastrous, potentially. Uh, and importantly, as you're training new models over time with new data or with new architectures, your models are going to fail and regress silently. It's inevitable that things drift. And you want to be able to catch those regressions. You don't want them to be silent. You want them to be surfaced so that you can address them. So a core message that I want to convey here is we need to pay close attention to your test data sets. Of course, ML engineers are going to be using tests to guide their development, reflect improvements. They're going to be looking at everything we just looked at in order to guide the development of the models. And everything that we know about our model behavior before we push it to production is going to be learned from these tests. And it's not just ML engineers, it's also product management. This is how product managers are encoding their product objectives. You're encoding what you want to see in the product as a test so that you know what exactly your product capabilities are and that you're achieving the thresholds that you need in order for your product to be successful. And then similarly, for 
business teams, sales teams, your customers, your tests are communicating your behaviors and your capabilities and your uh, basically your confidence at handling each of these different areas. So the key message here, properly managing your testing data is more important than your training data. Your training data is obviously important, but managing your testing data is how you're going to really make sure that your model is performing exactly the way that you need. And so this is where you can get the most gains in terms of model quality is focusing on your testing data. So what I'm talking about here is a, a paradigm shift to scenario testing from where we have been in the past up to now in many cases still, where we have these unbalanced arbitrarily split benchmarks. Let's say this is a representation of your data and you've just arbitrarily colorized and using those as different test sets but they're arbitrary. You, there are not clear scenarios represented within those test data sets. We want to move from that to something more like this, where you're testing on specific scenarios, specific classes. You're re curating those based on what you expect to see in your data set or based on your exploration of your actual data. So for example, looking at images where there's an unusual aspect ratio, or where there's low occlusion, high occlusion, and getting metrics for each of those things. And when you're evaluating your models, you might see something like this, or, or rather, so how to interpret this if let's look at each one of these corners is a subclass, a scenario. The blue shaded area is how much test data we have for each of those scenarios. And the red line is how well our model is performing. If we only have an aggregate model, we're basically just getting the area of the red we're basically saying, OK, it's doing pretty well because we're getting mostly weighted by all of these other classes. But what's not obvious, if we don't have something like this, where you're broken it down by subclasses, that subclass D is not performing very well. And it's probably because we have very little test data here. So we're not doing well at handling this particular subclass. And that's going to be hidden unless you've broken down into scenario levels. So this model looks like a high performer but it's because subclass D is absent from the test data, is not well represented, so it's not necessarily showing up in your aggregate metrics. So what I've been talking about so far is this scenario level testing. Now I'm gonna talk about regression testing. So chasing this long tail with regression test, making sure that your models aren't silently regressing and building up this institutional knowledge base. Regressions, so, Regressions are, are these failure modes. You want to catch these. You want to identify your regressions, ensure that your improvements from your previous iterations are still present over time. You're not silently dropping and getting masked by improvements elsewhere. If you're only looking at aggregate metrics, you might miss these things. Models change, data changes, regressions happen. It's inevitable that there is some shift over time and some, some area of performance is likely to encounter a regression at some point. So you want to have unit tests that you're creating every time that you encounter a regression so that every time thereafter, you're automatically checking to make sure that that regression isn't happening. And over time, you're building up a set of these regression tests, this institutional knowledge base of all of these failure modes that have been encountered, and you're able to automatically verify going forward that you're not running into these regressions when you want to deploy a new model that's getting doing better on the aggregate level. And this is really necessary if you want to truly chase down that long tail, because you have to be very systematic if you want to get far down the long tail. And a key uh, idea here for how to, to build up this long tail, it's it can be a little daunting to think, OK, I have to think about every possible test case. How am I going to do this? Especially if you're not you know, a, a domain expert, you may not be aware of all of the different possible failure modes. But that's OK if you're following this model quality flywheel. That starts with an initial problem understanding. So we have some limited testing scenarios to represent our initial understanding of the domain. Let's say you're a self-driving car. You've, you're using computer vision for self-driving. You've got some initial scenarios you know that you want to perform well during the day, at nighttime, when it's raining, and when it's snowing. Those are your initial unit tests, your initial scenarios. You'll go ahead and test against those. You'll start to see how your models are performing. Um, this graph is a little, probably a little hard to see on the slide, but each one of these lines represents the performance on each one of these test cases. 
This is giving you an idea of how your model is performing at the scenario level for those initial set of scenarios that you've identified. As you do that, you gain this deeper domain understanding. You can take a look at this failure modes. So you can take a closer look at where things aren't performing well, which scenarios aren't performing well, why those scenarios aren't performing well, taking a look at the data. You're analyzing those failure modes. And then you add more granular test cases. So you break down those failure modes. You break down our initial scenarios into finer grained scenarios so that you can uh, target where your model is not performing as well. And work directly towards improving those. And that means that you're building up this institutional knowledge base. So you essentially have a, a managed set of test cases where you're standardizing your model testing. You, we're going from, you're looking at this blue row, that's the four that we had here for weather. Um, now we're breaking it down by uh, how much occlusion there is, how much noise there is in the image, and the cross product of all of these. So for every possible nighttime scenario and every possible occlusion scenario within that nighttime scenario. And you're building this up over time and you're able to automatically test against that. And that's gonna really help you catch this long tail of edge cases. And this is this is a flywheel. It keeps going and you build that up over time and end up with a much more robust model. Just to illustrate that in another way here, this is what it might look like when you've got a set of test cases, test suites built up. You're ending up with this standardized product quality criteria. For example, this set of test cases has to do with vehicle orientation, top view, side view, front view, et cetera. This set of test cases we've built up based on identifying the type of car. This one is related to lighting and weather, and so on. For every type of variable that you have, every kind of distribution that you have within your data set. And having this institutional knowledge base of edge cases means that you're able to manage your test coverage. You, everybody is on the same page. You can communicate that test coverage to any, any stakeholder that's involved. And that really helps to build team alignment and trust around your testing, team alignment uh, as well for your customers, for your external stakeholders. Um, and this is how you gain confidence that your testing is adequate, is, is achieving the goals that you set out. Another illustration here, you are wanting to compare and deploy the best model for the task. This is another view of looking at performance for test cases. We've got this top level aggregate metric here for each of these two different models. And we're taking a look at, you know, how are these subclasses performing? So these are our granular. So this one, for example, is the interior view of the car um, related to orientation. We can see right away that there's been a regression on this F1 score and that we can focus on that. So that if we do want to deploy this better aggregate model, we know to focus on this test case that we've uh, spotted and crystallized to automate against. Over time, this is kind of a, a symbolic representation, an abstract representation of what I'm talking about. You're building up an intuitive behavioral report card. What I mean by that is you have some sense for what scores are good enough what scores are not good enough. And you can look at those scores across every scenario that you've identified from your initial scenarios through the scenarios that you broke, dive deeper into as you've encountered regressions or as you've looked more into the data. And these unit tests are reflecting the desired set of behaviors for your model and the required thresholds that you need to generate a report card for your models. How well is your model performing? And you'll end up something like this where you can see, okay, uh, a, B, or A is doing fine. B has had a regression here, but it's still pretty good. Scenario G is a big problem. It's performing very poorly. There's, we've even had a regression. And this is going to get past that problem of how aggregate metrics alone don't communicate much. You need to see something like this in order to truly evaluate the performance for your models. So I've talked about scenario level testing talked about regression testing, catching your failure modes, building up this institutional knowledge base. The last thing I want to cover here is product level testing. So testing system end to end, not just the component models and looking at product level metrics, not just traditional ML metrics for these individual models. So we're going to take a look at this example from this uh, 
joint attention in autonomous driving. This is a, another public data set. Here's the archive uh, identifier if you want to go check this out. Basically, it's a data set for evaluating for they're do, it's doing a couple of things here. It's identifying pedestrians and then it's determining whether they are crossing the street because you don't want to run into them, obviously. <laughs> it's a big problem. We want to avoid that. And the product here is uh, got this model pipeline. So there are two individual component models here, just for, as a simplification. We've got a pedestrian detector, so detecting whether these objects that are in the image are people, are pedestrians, and tracking those, and then feeding whatever is tracked into a classifier that says whether or not that pedestrian that's been identified is crossing the street. And if they are crossing the street, we obviously want to stop the vehicle. We don't want to run into those person. We want to avoid uh, intersecting with them. So each one of these is its own model, and we are evaluating models uh, against those things. So for this one, we compared sort versus deep sort. For this one, we compared the C3D versus this static BGG16 ResNet50. Uh, when we're looking just at the performance of these, these were the winners. The deep sort was the best at detecting pedestrians. C3D was the best at classifying. But when we looked at the total pipeline, so what's performing the best at truly identifying who is crossing and what's a true collision risk, it turned out that this pipeline was better. So sort, even though it wasn't doing as well at pedestrian detection, it turns out deep sort was doing a little too well. It was identifying pedestrians that were irrelevant. And so the it was it ended up the pipeline ended up getting penalized because it wasn't doing as well across the entire uh, pipeline. So what this gets at is that you want a product level metric that's going to let you identify which is the best pipeline, not just these individual model metrics, which will only tell you the performance of the individual models. So to illustrate that a little further, still looking at the same thing here. Let's say you're evaluating two systems. You got false negatives. Uh, we want to, in this case, we want low false negatives. We want high recall because we don't want to miss any people. We don't want to accidentally run into anybody that's very bad. We want to make sure we avoid that. So we've got false negatives as this key metric. But we want to do more than that. We want to do, dig in a little deeper. So we've defined this product level metric, this custom metric called is collision risk. And what this is doing is saying, okay, for each of these false negatives, for each of these 100 here, for each of these 30 here, let's also look at how many of them are within 10 meters. We're going to define that as a new metric called is collision risk. And when we do that, it turns out that of those 100 for system A, only five were collision risks, whereas for system B, 25 of them were collision risks. So it turns out that system A is actually a better choice because what we really care about at the product level is collision risk. And this is what we were going to end up wanting choosing. And this is something that you can identify because you've got a product level metric to help you catch that. So to summarize these three areas that I just mentioned, a rigorous ML quality process is hard to implement. It requires these different areas that I've been discussing. And the key point I want to make is that these are produced iteratively. You have to have a culture that, that values quality repeatedly and always, not just a one-time effort, uh, not through you know, finding some new groundbreaking architecture, because the nature of the domain that we're in is that things are constantly changing. So implementing this quality process requires high-resolution testing, getting at the scenario level, getting at that unit test level. You have to standardize your regression handling, the tests that you, to catch your failure modes. And you need to have a systematic process, especially if you want to scale. If you want to scale up your product, if you want to scale up your team, you need to make sure that you have a systematic process in place. Otherwise, it'll get unwieldy, and you'll start to have more and more failures that you're not able to catch. So Kalena, we really uh, made Kalena in order to, to make this robust and systematic ML testing easy and accessible. So what I want to do now is just get hands-on with an example of what this would look like if you were starting with a new data set and you wanted to go through each of the steps that I was just discussing and start to, to go from basically the raw data to a quality standard, to a set of test cases that are representative of the desired performance you want for your model. We're going to be looking at a, a 3D object detection example. What we're going to be looking at, this is this data set called Kitty. It's a it's comprehensive open source data set. 
Institutes for Mobile Robotics and Autonomous Driving Research. It's a, we're going to be looking particularly at the 3D object detection part of the, of the overall benchmark. Uh, it includes about 7,500 images with objects like cars and pedestrians. And it's got a wide array of sensor data. It's got stereo cameras. It's got LiDAR point clouds. Um, and this is captured in real world urban environments, like ones that autonomous vehicles uh, would encounter. This is an example of, this is a representation rather of the data that's in this data set. We can see that we've got images. We've got these bounding boxes to identify these objects. These are the different fields that are in the data set. So we've got these ground truth, which are the bounding boxes for both 2D and 3D. Locator is basically where the image is stored. And then we have these other variables, this other metadata that's part of the data, indicating the number of cars in the image, the number of cyclists, the number of pedestrians, total objects, and then more image data. So this, this is the left camera. We also have access to the right camera. We also have access to the LiDAR information through this Velodyne. So starting from this data set, here's what we're going to do. This is what I'm going to do with you right now. You'll want to upload, explore, and analyze the data. This is what I'm going to do with you here. We're going to look at the data distributions and spot bias and gaps in our test data. We're going to curate representative testing scenarios based on our findings. We're going to make our unit tests based on what we've uh, look, based on what we're seeing in the data set. We're going to compare model performance across those testing scenarios. So after we've identifying after we've identified them, we're going to look at how our models are performing on each one of those subsets. And that's going to help us establish this quality standard, this comprehensive set of test cases um, that are establishing what, what's critical for us, uh, what are the critical unit tests and metrics that we actually care about. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and shift over to the Kalena application here. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> So what we're looking at here is the Kalina interface. What I'm going to do is I'm going to import a that Kitty data set. I'm just going to select it from cloud storage because we've got this connected to this Amazon S3 bucket with a bunch of public examples. I'm going to go ahead and pull in this Kitty uh, 3D object detection. This is just a CSV file. The CSV file contains that information that I was showing on the slide previously. This is going to pull in a little preview of what we're looking at. So we can see here. This is a preview. Well, this is what the rows look like. This is an expansion of what this an individual data point looks like. We can see we've got several bounding boxes. We've got some other metadata here, of total objects, number of cars, other images related. So this is the right image. And then we've also got information like the LIDAR. So I'm just going to tell Kalina to import this. This is going to take uh, just about a minute to import this data set in. Uh, and when that data set comes in, we're going to take a look at it more closely. Uh, I did want to show one more thing on the slides, actually. So let me come back to that. Oh, I guess I don't have that slide up, so never mind. But yeah, just to reiterate what we're going to be doing here. So I'm, within this Kalina platform, I'm going to be we're going to be looking at this data set that's uploading right now. We're going to look at these data distributions and spot bias and gaps in our test data. So let me go ahead and come back to that in the application. Well, oh, great. OK, so it's uploaded now. This is what we're looking at. We've basically just, I've just uploaded these 7,500 data points or so. Here's that information that I was talking about before. Here's some examples of what these images look like. And we want to explore these, so we're going to click Explore in Studio. The studio is just where we look at the data. We can dig into any one of these just as an illustration. So we can see here we've got these different bounded boxes. They have these different labels. These are all part of the data set that was provided. Kalena will also try and extract information based on the problem type that you're working with, the data types that you're working with, to provide additional metadata information that you can use. Uh, and uh, one thing that's uh, cool here, especially, is that you know right away we can start to look at this LiDAR data. This is out of the box here. We just uploaded 
the data set, which included this uh, Velodyne information, this point cloud, 3D point cloud. And we can then look at that. We can see these different bounding boxes uh, for these different cars here. We've got these 13 different bounding boxes in this particular image. So this is our, this is a sample of what we're looking at, but we want to get a sense for the distribution of what our data looks like to get a, high, a high, higher level view to understand this data set. So over here in the distributions tab, basically all of the different fields that we have, the ones that are provided with the data set, in addition to any ones that we've extracted, we can look at how those are distributed. So for example, if we want to see occlusion levels, this is occlusion levels for the 3D uh, objects, ranging from basically no occlusion to high occlusion over here. Occlusion meaning how much the object is essentially blocked in the image. So let's say we want to look at images that have objects that have high occlusion. I'm going to select this. This is going to basically say, OK, we're going to set this filter where this value for this field is the higher, the highest range here, three or four. And we can come back to the studio with this filter set. And so now these are images where there is a good amount of occlusion. Go ahead and turn off the Velodyne. You can see that because there are so many cars here, they're kind of blocking each other. So there's a higher amount of occlusion in this image. And we want to make sure that our model is performing well against things that have high occlusion. So this is what we're going to start to look at. Basically, what we can do now is, OK, now that we've got this subset, we've got this subset of the total data set based on this filter, where we've got high occlusion based on our metadata, we can say, OK, let's go ahead and select all of these, and we're going to tag these. We're going to say the occlusion for these is high. And that's going to add that as a metadata field to each of these images that I've got selected so that we can then use that key value pair that I just specified to break it down into a test case later on. Um, that'll take just a minute. There we go. And now you can see we've got this new field here, occlusion, high. Uh, and this is based on how we filtered the data uh, looking at that occlusion information. And now we've given an explicit tag that we can leverage to create new test cases. Same thing if we wanted to then go back and look at, let's say we wanted to, now I'm going to clear that filter. We want to look at the next level down. We would select that. This one will create a new filter here. We would come back into the studio. Now we're looking at things that have kind of like this medium high level of occlusion. We could do the same thing where we select them all. We add a field. We say occlusion. Uh, let's just say medium high, medium high. Submit, etc. And you can very quickly break down. Uh, you start to break down these different scenarios based on this metadata that we're very easily accessing here, very easily filtering based on the different distributions. And I'm just looking at occlusion here, but it could be for any of the variables in the data. And that data could be provided with the data set or extracted from the data set based on what you're looking at. So rather than going through all of this manually one by one, I've got another data set where I've already prepared, I've already staged some of this. So I'm going to jump over to that one. This is the same data set, but I've already prepared this with some more of those uh, occlusion. So I've just gone through that same process where I have identified for each bucket of occlusion level and given it a, a string label like high, medium, low, et cetera. I've also done similarly for vehicles. So I've identified the types of vehicle and given them a name like car or van, in addition to all of the information that we had before. And now what this will let us do um, let's say we want to, okay, now that we've identified these scenarios of high occlusion and different types of vehicles, we can go over to this debugger tool. The debugger tool is just a way for us to, to look deeper at how our models are performing or how the data looks against itself in terms of these different variables that we've established. So I want to say, okay, let's look at the different levels of occlusion. So across our entire data set, this is the information that we've just established. We've created these new buckets high, medium, low, no occlusion, et cetera. And we want to know, OK, for each of these occlusion levels, let's look at how we're doing uh, across each uh, vehicle type. The way to interpret this here is that the ones that are shaded uh, according to this kind of redder tint means we have a lot of test data points. This number rec represents how many 
images we have for this particular combination. So for medium occlusion car, we have a lot of data. But what this the insight that pops out immediately here is that for this tram vehicle type, we can see that we don't have a whole lot of test data for any level of occlusion, especially not for high occlusion here. And that means, OK, if we want to make sure that we're performing robustly across all of these classes, that means that we need to focus on improving the resources we have for this test data set, meaning adding more data or focusing uh, in another way on addressing this because the way that we're evaluating against this is not going to be particularly robust. If you're only evaluating against 17 images, that's probably not going to be enough for you to be confident in the performance of your model. And this is something that you can do for any of the variables that we've established. These are two that I just added to this data set using that same process that I showed you before, going in, taking a distribution, giving it a little tag for occlusion, same thing, giving these things tag for vehicle. And we can already see this breakdown here. So we can get granular in terms of how we're breaking things down, and we can learn where to focus, where we're, where we're strong and where we're weak. So as you're doing this, you are, you are getting a sense for the things you want to be testing against, and you can start to compile that in this quality standards view. The quality standards view are basically the test cases and the metrics that you want to save uh, and define as your standard quality. So the creating test cases is very simple. We can use these variables that we've just created. So I'm going to say, OK, we want to have a test case for every level of occlusion across the entire test data set. Kalina will automatically break these down. So we can see we've got a test case for each level of occlusion. We can see exactly how many data points we have for each of these. I'm going to go ahead and click Save. We can do that for everything else as well. So I'm going to do the same thing for vehicle. It's going to break this down into every possible value for vehicle. We can see here, Kalena is automatically flagging that this tram is an underrepresented test case because on a relative basis, we don't have very many data points. So we can see right away, if, we're, if I'm coming in and I'm a model manager, I can see, OK, this is an area where I need to focus on getting more test data. Go ahead and click Save. And then I'll add uh, one more, let's say uh, the number of cars in the image. And I want those to be broken down in specifically into, rather than quantiles at the default here, I want to say we want, let's say six, let's say six evenly spaced bins. What this will do is it'll take for the full range of values for number of car in the data set, it's going to break that down, break down that full range into six bins. We can see that the most images have between zero and six cars. And at the higher range where there's a lot of cars, we have very few data points. And so if we want to be robustly testing and catching everything when there's a lot of cars in the image, we'll save these as test cases. And now forever after, we will automatically be able to see how things are performing across each of these test cases. Just so that just even though we just define these things, we can very quickly start to evaluate performance. And we, in order to evaluate performance, we're going to want to define metrics, of course. The metrics are going to be how you actually decide how your models are performing. So in this case, we're looking at an object detection problem. I'm going to go ahead and select object detection. It's going to bring in some suggestions for the types of metrics that are most useful here. Precision recall, F1 score, for example, average precision. We can use a different averaging method. Uh, I'm just going to leave it as macro for now, just kind of a raw averaging. I'll go ahead and add these in. Basically, uh, now we're going to have each of these metrics for each of those test case scenarios. We can see the calculation for how these metrics were established. And I'm just going to close this out. We can see the same thing right here. So this is our quality standard. We can see all the test cases that we want to be testing against. And these are the metrics for how we're going to be evaluating those test cases. So let's see what that looks like. I'm going to go ahead and click View Model Results. These are two models. Uh, actually, let me show you how I upload those models. So say when we're ready to upload model results, same process that I used to upload the data set. Within that public data set folder, there's this subfolder. It's just another CSV file where each row is going to have an ID that it corresponds to each image in the test data set. And now, instead of ground truths, it's the inferences for this particular model. So we're seeing the bounding box that was generated by this model for this image. And we'll calculate metrics by comparing this inference against the ground truth that's in the image. 
This has already been imported, so I won't click import, but same thing that would happen here. We just click import, it'll automatically be associated. And then when we come back to the quality standards, we'll see it pop up here. So now I can go ahead and say, okay, let's look at this point pillars model that we've trained previously. Uh, and we want to compare it against this other model that we've just trained. And how this is going to look here is each of these larger columns is a model. Each of the individual columns within that is a metric that we've defined. Each row represents a test case. This top row is the full data set. So this is the aggregate metric. This is where if you're not breaking things down into scenario, scenario level, this is all you might be seeing. It's just this aggregate row. But now we've broken things down. It only took a few minutes to, to break down this occlusion uh, variable here. But now we can see across each possible value of occlusion, how are our models performing against each other? And the colorizing here is showing, OK, this model compared to our reference model over here, what are the changes? I'm going to tune down the significance just to highlight some things here. So we can see, for example, that while this second model is performing quite well across most areas, it's definitely doing better across everything, all of our top level metrics here, we can see that there are regressions right away. So we only just now defined this TRIAM test case and we can already see that for this new model that we might want to use, it's actually doing worse on recall, and we can start to focus on that. Or similarly, down here, when there's a lot of cars in the image, we can see that our precision is not doing uh, particularly well, and we can start to focus on that right away. And we were able to do, we were able to start getting granular like this right away, very quickly, uh, by breaking down these test cases and saying, and just establishing what met which metrics we care about. And we're automatically getting a look at how those metrics compare across these different test cases. So just to reestablish the, the key point here is that the goal of all of this is you want to end up with something like this that's a quality standard. Whatever you're using to get to a quality standard like this, this is the kind of thing that you need, where you've got a set of these test cases that represent what you care about most. This is also where you would establish your product level metrics. Right here, we're looking at model level metrics, but you could also establish your product level metrics here so that when you're evaluating, you're ending up with that intuitive behavioral report card that I showed uh, in the slide previously. So let me actually go ahead and uh, jump back to the slides here. Cool. So yeah, before I move on, I just want to show that uh, behavioral report card again, just to hammer home this point. A little further back than I thought. There we go. The idea is you're getting towards something like this, where you're automatically seeing how your scenarios are performing. You're getting the raw scores. That's this raw colorizing. And then you're getting directionally when you're comparing new models. Are things improving? If they're green across the board, that means you can feel confident pushing that model to production. If there are regressions, that means you need to go back and make sure that you're handling those regressions. And you can do that systematically. You can do that robustly, automatically. That's that's the key. That's the goal. That's the goal. You want to be able to chase the long tail that way. All right. Uh, coming up on the end of the talk here, um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, I'll, we've gotten some in the chat, so I'll go ahead and uh, see if I can answer a couple of those out loud. But just to reiterate, so what, what does an end-to-end -end AI quality management platform look like? What do you really want if you're looking for something to manage your testing process? And these are the key areas that you're really going to need. You want something that's going to help you manage your data quality and something that's going to help you manage model quality. Data quality, that means you need to be able to explore and analyze your data dig into the data, look at the distributions, see what your scenarios are. What are the different scenarios that are actually in your test data? Looking at the distributions for any information that you have or any information that you're enhancing as you're exploring the data, being able to quickly look at those distributions so you can get a high level view. Um, versioning is really important. That's not something I touched on already, but versioning is very important so that you can handle things like data drift or look at how things are changing over time. You want to be able to have versioning for each new data set and for each new set of models. And then we're building up this standardized test coverage. So ensuring your model quality by ensuring that you're testing against everything that's important. Being able to compare models is obviously critical if you want to compare models. And a tool that let you do custom reporting is very useful, um, especially if you want to be quickly analyzing and exploring your data. Something that lets you generate a custom report is going to be really, really valuable.
So just to summarize here before I move on to the questions, robust testing is really the only way to ensure your model quality and safety. Uh, there are three levels of systematic testing, scenario level, regression, and product level, or end-to-end -end testing. You can think about it as end-to-end -end testing. And there are, are really three pillars there. There's managing your data quality, managing your model quality, and then looking at your end-to-end -end quality. How are you doing uh, and across the entire end-to-end uh, -end pipeline for a product or for a feature? And the steps that we follow that I just demonstrated in, in Kalena, but you can do with whatever tool you're using. You want to be able to explore, analyze data down to the scenario level, get granular, look at your metadata distribution. So look at the distributions that describe your data. You want to be able to flag or identify where you have bias or gaps in your test data, the lack of coverage or uh, unusual performance. In that process, you want to curate these representative testing scenarios that represent the kind of real world data that your model is going to be encountering. You want to be able to compare models automatically against each of those testing scenarios so that you can be confident in choosing a model, which models to deploy in the real world. And you're building towards this setting a quality standard of the, the, the critical unit test. What's critical for you to test against? What are the metrics that are most important for us to correctly evaluate? And that allows you to do automation as you build towards each of your deployments. Uh, a note on further resources, and then I'll go ahead and we've got just a couple of minutes here. That's, I My team's helping me answer some questions here, but I'll see if I can read one out loud. First one, if you want to take a look at this Kitty object detection data set, here's the URL for that. This is a public data set. It's got uh, 2D object detection, 3D object detection, a couple other things. Uh, we've compiled a metrics glossary that's got a whole bunch of different metrics for all kinds of different problems, including computer vision. So if you're curious about what kind of metrics are most useful for evaluating a computer vision workflow, go ahead and check out our metrics glossary here. And then on our blog, we've got a whole bunch of different articles and guides on best practices, quality, education, uh, testing, and learning how to test properly, things like that. Well, all right, let me open up uh, the q and I'll see if I can answer a couple of questions. Uh, so there's one here about continuous learning and model updating. How do I continuously update models with new data without degrading performance on previously learned scenarios? So uh, as as you get more data from these niche scenarios or your failure modes, um, yeah, it's very common to wonder if retraining or fine tuning actually improves the model. Um, you'll want a tool that makes it easy to compare and contrast all of your model's versions and see how performance differs for any test case. That way you can see a clear before and after of regressions or improvements on previous model versions against your newest version. Um, and yeah, this, this would outline regressions on previously learned scenarios too, ensuring that um, your model updates are appropriate in your deployment pipelines. Let's see here. Mm. Uh, let's see here. How do I handle rare but critical scenarios that may not be well represented in training data? Uh, yeah, this is a big challenge, um, but it's pretty important if you want to be robust uh, and ensure safety. Um, it's important to get to drive towards an understanding of what the critical scenarios are and then grow that population in your training data set. So that's finding those uh, gaps. That's finding those those low numbers, basically, in the, the reporting that we were looking at and then working towards collecting, curating, and feeding that more examples of that into your model training so that when your model does encounter those things again in the test data, it's better prepared to, you're, you're better able to evaluate and choose models and, and have those models learn against those, those uh, uh, things that aren't well, well represented. So by looking at your test data and by looking at your performance across these curated scenarios, you're, you're, you're helping to identify where things aren't well represented. Um, it's also helpful to involve adversarial training, transfer learning. You can enhance the model's exposure to scenarios that way. Um, and Kalena really tries to, to make that whole process easy. All right, let's see. I think I've got uh, 
Maybe time for just one more question here. Ah, so there's a question about uh, matching, let's see, matching the output of the models to the test data sets. So the way that that's working in Kalena here is that basically you've got a, a test data set. Every test sample within that test data set has a unique identifier. When you are running your models against that test data set, you just need to have it output that uh, associate that same identifier for each image that is generating an inference for. That way, when you are adding your model results for comparison, you, all, all that has to be done is to associate those IDs such that for every test sample, you know the model inferences that were generated for each model against that particular test sample. And then you can, in order to calculate metrics, it's as simple as just comparing the uh, inferences to the ground truth that was in the data set based on that correspondence by the ID. Cool. Uh, I see there's a bunch more question. Uh, we don't have enough time for me to get to that, but I don't want to leave anybody hanging. So if you have more questions, I'm happy to connect. Here's my email address. Feel free to email me. Um, we've also got a lot more smart people on the team who can help out with any more uh, difficult technical questions that you've got. So feel free to hit me up. Feel free to hit us up with any questions that you've got. Thank you very much for attending. I hope this was useful for you and that you get more robust computer vision testing for your computer vision systems. Uh, I'll see you all next time at our next webinar. Thank you very much.